we are LCC International University, and it's the only North American style university um, in Europe. Uh, we are located in Lithuania and Klaipeda. So if you look at this map over here, this uh, small red country um, and the north by the Baltic Sea is Lithuania, and we're in this tip over there close to um, Kaliningrad and it's Pipeta, a beautiful city where LCC has found its home um, now 30 years ago. And uh, we um, offer bachelor and master level programs to students from all around the world. Um, so we are a North American style university. We teach in English and most of our professors come from Canada and United States. We are a liberal arts university. Uh, and that's the model that many American schools share. Uh, we are international. Uh, we have students coming from more than 50 different countries of the world. We are a Christian uh, university that's um, very inclusive in terms of its students. So we accept students from all backgrounds um, and religions or no religions at all. We are fully accredited in the European Union and we are recognized worldwide. So our graduates, um, they have opportunities to work, travel and live anywhere they want. And we are relational. We're a small university and we care about each and every of our students. So uh, it's important for us to connect um, even in such a way through uh, a screen, but still, you know, to talk to our students or to our prospective students to share um, and to learn together. So just a little bit about our programs. Uh, we currently offer six programs in uh, our BA level, and those are business, contemporary communications, English, international relations, psychology, and theology. Um, and and um, we have two programs in the master's level. It's an MA in international management and MA in TESOL. Um, and as I was sharing in the beginning, we have um, quite a few programs um, that are developed for young people like you who are not at the university right now, but who might be interested in joining and learning more. And this is what LCC Academy is for. Uh, so again, I'm going to repeat myself and share just a little bit more. Um, this um, is a non-degree program for those who want to try out what it is like to study at the university, uh, at an international uh, North American style university. Um, so we'll be offering this lectures on a weekly basis and um, you can um, try and visit all lectures or you can choose the ones that are most interesting for you. Um, so you can um, choose the format um, of your attendance and participation. And also uh, there is a way um, to earn a participation certificate. And uh, for that, you have to um, listen to at least four lectures and join uh, an online discussion forum. So please stay until the end. And um, I will give you more information about that. Uh, for now, I guess I can give the floor to our presenter, Dr. Milliken. Uh, and he will be sharing with us today on the topic of freedom. So once again, um, thank you everyone who joins us. Uh, please type your comments in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them at the end um, of, of this meeting. All right. Thank you so much, Lydia. And uh, thank you all of you, whoever is out there. It's uh, nice to be able to be with you this evening and talk to you a little bit about a topic that I think is actually really important. And it's it's a topic that we, a word that we talk a lot about, freedom. Everyone likes freedom. We all believe in freedom, I suppose. Um, but also a topic maybe that we don't pause to think so carefully about sometimes. And I think it's freedom's really, really central to Western culture. And what I want to do today is to help to unpack the notion of freedom a little bit and really 
maybe complicate it a little bit and help you to think about freedom maybe in some ways that you haven't done before. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you, share my screen with you that you can uh, so you can follow along a bit on what I'm saying. But as I do that, and kind of push a few buttons to make that happen. I just want to put a question to you to think about. I'm not going to ask for you to tell me. Um, I suppose you, you would be welcome in the comments if you wanted to write in some ideas that you had in this way. But I want you to just think for a minute, if I asked you to write down for me, what is freedom? How would you define that? What is freedom? What does that mean to you? Okay, so think about that just for a moment while I get the, the presentation up here. Okay, what is freedom? Do you have it? Hopefully you have some kind of answer in mind there and maybe it'll be interesting to, as we go along to see whether or not you would like to revise what you were saying there about freedom at all or not. So what is freedom? Do we have it? It's interesting, you know, I was just thinking about as I was preparing for this, we're in a kind of a weird season in the world right now, obviously. And maybe there are some freedoms that we're used to that we notice a little bit more now than we used to do. Freedom to do things like move around, freedom to gather with friends, freedom to go outside without wearing a mask on our face and things like that. Uh, so certainly I think this topic is a one that's on our minds in one way or another. So I wanna begin by very, very briefly in a very broad kind of way, talking a little bit about the idea of freedom and the way that that has shifted a little bit in over the past few hundred years. And I guess by shifted, I mean, when we think about freedom, what we tend to think about there, I think is a little bit different. And this gentleman you can see on the screen, his name is John Locke. And he was a really important British philosopher, someone who wrote uh, really important works about rights and he developed kind of a, a view of government and, and uh, freedoms and things like that in, that in a political kind of context. And so when someone like Locke is writing and thinking about our freedoms, he has in mind particularly the way that we relate to the government or to the state. And so Locke develops this interesting view about how the state is limited in certain ways by uh, the rights that individuals have within the society. So he says the government gets its authority by the consent of those who are under its rule, and they should have a, a sphere of freedom where the government is not permitted to do certain kinds of things. For example, they should have property rights, and so they are free to possess property, free to do certain things with their property, and the government doesn't have any, uh, any power to interfere with certain kinds of rights like that. Now, so when Locke is thinking about freedom, he's thinking about a political notion. He's thinking about the way that you as an individual have, if you like, kind of room to operate without the interference of the state. But something that's interesting about Locke is when you think about that room that we have without the state interfering with our lives, he says, somewhere else writing about this concept, he says, though it's a, a place of freedom, it's not a place of anything goes. He says there is a, a moral law. It's not a law given by the government, but as a moral law, Locke would say it's given by God. And this operates too, so that we have constraints, we have limits to what we can do. So we're not like absolutely free to do whatever we want. Freedom just means that the government can't impose certain kinds of things upon us. And so we have a sphere of liberty, we have a sphere of freedom. The rights help us to make sense of what that sphere is, but there are also limits to our freedom set by uh, this notion of the moral law that exists as well. This little, this just a little snippet of the United States Constitution, which was a document and a system of government that was very heavily influenced by Locke. 
those who wrote the constitution were readers of Locke and, and uh, his ideas were really important to the United States. So it was again a, a country, a, a political situation that was founded on this idea of freedom understood in a very sort of political sense. And at that time, if you would have asked people in New England in maybe the year 1785 or something, what is, what's freedom all about? They might say something like, freedom means that the state has limits in what it can do to me. But if you were to ask, well, does that mean you can do anything you want? Again, they would say, well, no, there is a law that's in place, a moral law that we have to pay attention to. And at that time in history, there was also, a, if you like, social requirements that were pretty important. So people felt bound in different ways by the expectations of others, by customs, by what was done and what was appropriate. And of course, we still experience those things, but they experience those in a much, much greater th degree than we do. Now, this guy is another British thinker. His name is John Stuart Mill, and he shows up a bit later. So he is living and writing during the 1800s and writing in the middle of the 1800s, an important book called On Liberty. And liberty, of course, another word for freedom. So Mill writes this book about freedom. And I wanted to talk about Mill because in him, I think we see a really interesting shift in what the emphasis is when we're talking about freedom. And yes, Mill believes in political freedom, and uh, he is interested in thinking about what the state can do in relationship to the individual. In fact, he, he says that the only reason why the state can interfere with the individual is to prevent harm to other people. So he wants to set a very strict limit about what the state is able to do. And if you think about that for a moment, it's a really strict limit because some things that we take for granted, like we think, okay, the state can tell us to wear a seatbelt when we're driving in our automobile. You know, Mill would say, they cannot tell you to do that because if you're not wearing a seatbelt and you crash into something and you get hurt, that's your problem. That's not the state's problem. So the state can only require you to do something to prevent you from harming someone else. So any of these kinds of laws that are for your own good or protection, Mill says, are illegitimate and the state shouldn't do things like that. But here's the thing that is really interesting in our, for our purposes today about Mill is he also has this idea of freedom different than Locke of kind of our personal freedom. So it's not just about what the state, the limits the state has about what they can do, but it also he's interested in the limits of the society around us the expectations of other people, the norms of other people. And he wants to really clear this, this really full space for individuals to be free, not just from the powers of the law, but from the opinions of other people to live as they see fit. I wanna read just a quote from what he says here. Mill says, the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. He uses a little bit old language here, but he says, here's freedom. I get to do what seems best to me as long as I don't interfere with other people doing what seems best to them. And here I see we, I think we can see a shift towards something that feels like a very modern, a very contemporary way of thinking about freedom. It's no longer the focus a bond like me and the state or the government, but more this idea about what does it mean for me to have a personal space of freedom to do the things that I would want to do. So philosopher Charles Taylor says, here's how our culture, now fast forwarding to today, he'd say, this is how we would think about freedom. Let each person do their own thing. And one shouldn't criticize the other's values because they have a right to live their life as you do. So it's kind of like Mill in more modern language, right? Freedom means being able to do the things that I want to do as long as I don't harm other people. And here I've, when I ask students who are in live and I can hear what they say and respond to me about this, say, tell, give me off the top of your head, what's your understanding of freedom? This is what I hear most often. I would say 98% of the time, people say freedom means being able to do what I want as long as no one else is hurt. 
I want to give just a couple of examples of this that we see in our in our present day culture, just to show how this is a pretty common way of understanding this. Um, this book right here with the four hour work week, author of Timothy Ferris, this was a big bestseller a few years ago. And in case you're wondering what in the world is this book all about, he's explaining in the book how you can work just four hours a week and still be really wealthy. And um, if you wonder like, how does that really work? Well, the basic answer is that you outsource a lot of your work to like um, people who are work for a lot less in like Bangladesh or something like that. But anyway, what caught my attention as I was looking at this book was the introduction. And he says, in this book, I wanna help you to see how you can live the millionaire lifestyle of complete freedom. I thought, oh, this is really interesting. The lifestyle of complete freedom, what does that mean? And he goes on to say, that means that you're able to have enough money and to have enough time, so you're only working four hours a week, to go where you want, do what you want, and uh, enjoy the things in life uh, that are important to you. And <clears throat> there was uh, another quote that I found online that I think captures the spirit of this really, really well. So this person wrote, this is, in my opinion, is the personal definition of freedom. And I think that word is actually important there, not political, personal. Having a lot of money in your bank account where you can do whatever you want, go wherever you like, and live your life however you wish without anyone's permission, approval, or interference. End of the quote. So this is the understanding. Um, do what you want as long as other people are um, not harmed in some way by that. So you can see why uh, money actually becomes kind of important for our present day understanding of freedom. The other thing, um, hold on, I'm, I'm seeing my, the, the video thing here is getting a little bit in the way of what I want to see. The other thing that I want to talk about briefly is this book by Edward Wilson on human nature. And this is really interesting because Wilson here is articulating, you might say, the philosophical foundation for the modern day understanding of freedom. Why should we think that freedom means about doing whatever I want as long as no one gets hurt. And Wilson says something interesting in his book, and he's a biologist. He writes about evolution and the human beings, and he's quite a famous biologist at that. And he says in the book here, well, we used to think that there was a God who had made the world and who had made us, and that meant that there was like a moral reality that we had to pay attention to. Remember, I said that was something Locke thought. There's a moral law given by God that constrains us. And he says, we also used to think that that means like there's a human nature that we have to pay attention to in some way. And he says, but now we understand that there is no God, there is no creation, there is no meaning, there is nothing given from the outside that constrains us as human beings. So Wilson says, we are radically free. We get to decide what we think morality is and what we think it's not. We get to decide what the purpose of life is and whether it has one and whatever we wanna make it to be. So the individual for Wilson is radically free in this one way, in this way to do your own thing and other people shouldn't criticize your values and they should have a freedom to live the same way as you because there's nothing outside of us that will give us any understanding of what our purpose of our values or anything like that might be. So this is just a sketch of a very common view about freedom in our time. Maybe it's not your view, and that's all right, but it's something that hopefully you can recognize as being important in the culture of which we are all a, a part. And what I want to do is raise some questions about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing some questions from an author named Timothy Keller, who writes about this, uh, about freedom. And he raises a few questions that I think are worthwhile thinking about. And the first, the first objection that he makes to this view, and again, what's the view here that freedom means doing whatever you want as long as no one else gets hurt, is he says, if you think about it for a moment, you can see that practically it doesn't really work like that. No one is really free to do anything that you want. Why not? Well, for one reason, you have to make trade-offs between the things that you want. So you might want to go to university when you're done 
studying in high school. Okay, so if you do that, if you make that choice, then that means there are other choices that you cannot make. For example, you cannot ignore all of your schoolwork and just party and have fun with your friends all that, that you want. You're going to have to do some studying. You're going to have to take tests. You're going to have to um, read things that you don't want to read because this is part of what you have to do in order to get into a university. And of course, if you decide to go and study university, that means then you cannot say go travel the world after you're done with high school instead. So just noticing this on a very basic level, you, you're not free to do whatever you want because some things that you want will mean that there are other things that you want that you cannot do and you have to make choices between them. So no one is free completely in that sense. We must trade some freedoms for others, submitting ourselves to certain kinds of constraints. But someone might say, okay, I see that, but aren't we free to pick our constraints? So I can decide if I want to go to university and I decide that and then I have certain things I can't do, but I didn't have to decide that. I could decide not to go to university and then there's other things that I can uh, decide what to do. So we're free to pick from our constraints, even if we recognize we must have some kinds of constraints. And one of the things that that Keller wants to help us to see in this point is that, well, this too, maybe it's not as simple as it first seems, because there are some constraints that seem to be just part of life. They're kind of baked into things and you can't avoid them. So for example, friendship, everyone wants friendship. Everyone wants to have friends. And there are some constraints that come with friendship just as a matter of necessity. Uh, honesty. If you're not honest with your friends, you're not gonna have very many of them or have them for very long. Um, some kind of consistency, looking out for your friends in some way, being with your friends in some way. These are, are parts of friendship that we can't sort of get around. Um, marriage is something that you might want someday. And fidelity, being faithful to your spouse is part of marriage that you can't get around. And again, someone might say, okay, I, I get that in a sense, but." I don't need friends, I don't need marriage, I don't need, I can choose in other ways and I don't have to pay any attention to those kinds of constraints. I think ultimately we get kind of stuck in this because I think one of the things you can't help wanting is happiness. You can't say, well, I don't really want my life to go well and I don't really want to flourish and I don't really want to be happy and I don't really want to succeed. Like those are basic things that human beings want and kind of unavoidably want. And so Keller might say, if, if you want those things, you recognize then you can't do anything you want. There are constraints that are really important there. Again, relationships is an obvious example. If you want to be actually happy in life, you're going to have to have relationships. There's a really interesting study done by Harvard University for, it's actually still going on, but they it's a study that's gone on for like 70 some years. So they took a group of young men who were students at Harvard, and then after that, a young a group of other young people who were in, this, in the city of Boston there as well. And they followed these people for decades and decades and decades. Every year, they were asking them questions, studying them, their health, studying their psychology. And one of the conclusions, the, the, the present person who's in charge of the study, he says, one of the most clear conclusions of this study over all these decades is this, that if you want your life to go well, if you want to be happy, if you want to be healthy, you've got to have deep and abiding relationships. So there are constraints that we cannot get around. If you want your life to go well, you're gonna to have to have relationships. And if you want relationships, then you have to submit to certain kinds of constraints you're, you're going to submit to. So we aren't completely free to decide those constraints given the nature of reality. But another kind of question we might say, or another objection we might say here is that this approach is unjust. So what do we mean by that? And again, this is the thought that like, hey, I should be free to do whatever I want. And remember the quote I read to you about uh, the person who said, without anyone's permission, approval or interference. So, hey, this is my life. I can choose to do the things I want and what other people say uh, doesn't have anything to do with that. But this, this approach is unjust because other people have invested in us and we don't belong to ourselves alone. Keller says this kind of attitude would make sense if you were self-created and if you somehow didn't depend upon other people for anything in your life. Then you can say, hey, what other people say doesn't matter. This is my life. I'll do with it what I want. 
But when you really think about it, you realize that your life is something into which many, many other people have poured lots and lots of resources. Parents are an obvious example of this. Teachers are an obvious example of this. Coaches are an example of this. Maybe friends, maybe neighbors, um, relatives. People have invested so much in us. So to think that somehow our life is just totally ours and we can do with it whatever we want without taking into consideration other people is, as Keller says here, unjust. Like it or not, we have a big impact on other people. I think it's a, you know, it's a heavy topic. It's a hard topic. Suicide is an example of this, where we see this kind of in the extreme. When someone takes their life, we, they might be thinking, it's my life. You know, I can take it. I can leave it. It's sort of up to me. Other people don't have a say in this. But we realize how, what a, a profound impact this actually has on other people. So Keller's point here is that, you know, it's a famous poem that says, no person is an island all by himself. We're connected to other people. Next thing we might say is that this approach also doesn't stand alone. So if we were to say like Mill does, here's the only rule we need to worry about. Free to do what you want as long as you don't harm others. The problem that we can see here right away is I could ask, well, okay, what is harming others? What counts as harm to others? There's this interesting debate that's happening in the United States right now on college campuses and other places about the free speech. And some people are saying, you know, if people are free to, to speak and to say whatever they want and to raise any kinds of ideas, this actually is harmful to some people because some ideas are offensive and other people are saying, no, that isn't a harm. Ideas can't harm you. Uh, you might not like them, but free speech is really, really important and you don't harm anyone by merely expressing ideas. So you can see there's a disagreement there about actually what counts as harm. So as soon as you say, yeah, we should be free as long as we don't harm other people, when you stop and think about it a bit, you realize that's really not an easy question. What is it that harms other people? And once we get into that, the, then we see that we have to bring into all kinds of other values and, uh, and moral considerations to be able to, to decide uh, what we can do. Then finally here, <clears throat> this view of freedom can be corrosive of community and relationships. Um, our individualism says, hey, it's, it's your life, make of it what you will. Um, you should be free to do whatever you want without taking other people into consideration. Uh, you know, it tends to erode community. It makes us more mobile. We move away from other people. We, we distance ourselves again from those relationships thinking, well, it's really uh, about my life and about what I think of as important and other people are not so important to this kind of equation. And this is not, Keller's not here saying you must stay put and you must sort of do your, live your life in a way that other people think is important. All he's saying is that we recognize that a radical kind of view of your own freedom pushes against other kinds of things that are also, we think of as pretty important. <clears throat> and one other thing finally to notice here is that freedom in love have a kind of a funny relationship to each other. If you say, here's, I, I wanna be free to do whatever I want as long as I don't harm other people. A love relationship doesn't really work that way, does it? When you are in a relationship with someone, suddenly your freedom isn't what it used to be. So you might've used to be free to, hey, I'm gonna go out of town for the weekend and drive to Palanga or whatever I feel like doing. And um, it's my time, do what I like or I'll watch a movie this night, I'll go out, I'll do whatever. When you have a boyfriend, you have a girlfriend, you have a serious other relationship, and now suddenly you feel like, oh, I need to, I need to tell this other person sort of what I'm doing and we need to maybe make plans together and I don't have the same kind of freedom that I had. So freedom and love actually don't go together that well. I can speak as a parent having children, like if you wanna have children and invest your love into relationships like that, you are not free anymore to do whatever you want as long as no one else is getting hurt. So these responsibilities that come with relationship are a severe limit to freedom. So again, if you felt like freedom is the most important thing that really got to hold on to this value, then this tends to push against values like community and relationship.
So all of this so far is ways of saying this, this idea, this, and really it's kind of a slogan that we have, I suppose, is life is not so simple as that. And I want to give us a different picture to show also that there's a really different way to think about freedom here. Because all of this so far, we've had in mind an idea of freedom that means somehow that we have a space in which other people don't interfere with what I'm doing. Okay, so freedom means people leave me alone and let me do the thing that I want to do. But there's a really different way of thinking about freedom. And I have a picture here on the screen of, of piano to, as an example of this. Suppose that you went to a concert and you saw a pianist who's playing the piano. And it's kind of amazing to watch a professional pianist because they're doing all these amazing things on the keyboard and it looks effortless and it looks, um, it looks like it's no problem for them. And we might say someone who's like that, they have complete freedom at the piano. So I remember watching this, this interview with this person who's really, really gifted pianist. And she's just sort of can make up a song as she's playing the interviewer is talking to her and she says, oh yeah, I can take a couple of chords and just make a song. And so he gives her two chords and she just starts playing this amazing sounding piece of music with that. And you might watch that and say, wow, that would be so cool to have that kind of freedom freedom to be able to play anything I wanted to on a piano. Now notice, this is a really different kind of freedom, isn't it? Because I, I can give you a piano and I can back away and say, I'm not gonna interfere, <laughs> you're free, do whatever you want on the piano, but you're not gonna be able to play unless you're really, really a talented pianist. You're not gonna be able to do any of that on the piano. So you have freedom in one sense, like no one's interfering with you, but you don't have freedom in this other sense of like the ability to actually do something. So we see that in lots of contexts. You might see a dancer and you might say, wow, that, that amazing picture of freedom or a figure skater or an athlete or whatever. And this is interesting because we see that that kind of freedom comes from a lot of restrictions on what you're able to do, a lot of hard work, a lot of um, choosing to do something that maybe you don't want to do in a certain kind of way. And so I want to use this as a kind of a transition to thinking about freedom maybe in a different light. So if we think of freedom, not just being left alone to do what we want, but freedom as actually being able to do certain kinds of things. One of, one of the ways in which I think we really can start to connect with this is we think about ourselves inside. So again, freedom, usually we think of things we're doing out here, but I want us to think now about freedom as an internal kind of thing. So what do I mean? Think of this example, imagine, imagine that you live in a country that is the freest country you can imagine, okay? So the laws say you can do whatever you want without harming anyone else. You don't have to wear seatbelts. You may use drugs, whatever it is. And imagine that you're also wealthy, like Timothy Ferris says. So you have the freedom of a millionaire, anything you want to do, okay? But now imagine on top of that, that you're a drug addict. Are you free? It seems like what we would want to say at this point is, no, obviously not. I'm free in those kind of external senses that we've been talking about, but I'm not free in an internal sense. I'm not free in kind of the way this picture of the piano would suggest. Like, I, I would really like to not want this drug. I would really like to live differently. I just cannot do it. I cannot bring myself to doing this. So there's, there's some way I want to be, some way I want to live that I find that I am not able to do. So call this um, an internal kind of freedom to live and to be in a way that we want to live and be. I can give an example about this from my, from my own life. Let's take a, a different example than drug addiction. I remember when I was a graduate student, there was another graduate student who I didn't, uh, I didn't like very well. We didn't get along that well. I suppose on the surface, it seemed fine. You wouldn't have known that there was any problem there. But inside, I felt like, ugh, I just, this uh, graduate student kind of drove me nuts. Now, I didn't like that. I didn't want this to be true, but I found that I wasn't free to not feel that way. Like he just drove me crazy. So there are many, many things that maybe you can think of too, that inside we feel like, I wish I didn't feel that way. I wish I didn't think that. I wish I didn't have these emotions, but nevertheless, we find that we don't have freedom 
in this particular area of our life. It might be things like anxiety, might be things like shame, might be anger, might be depression, might be addiction. But in whatever case, there are things inside where we're not free. An interesting question is why? What, what's going on there? And I have on the screen here a picture of a novelist. His name is David Foster Wallace. And he has an interesting kind of window on this question. The basic, the basic thing he wants to say is this, look, we, we all are going to live for something in life. You want happiness, you want meaning, you want satisfaction, you want purpose, and you're gonna look for that somewhere. And wherever it is that you think those things are found, you're going to be living for that thing. And that's gonna bring about this sort of unfreedom inside of your life. So I wanna read the quote that he has here and then maybe unpack that a little bit. He says this, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's no such thing as not worshiping. This is an interesting word here. He says, everyone worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. So in other words, he says, if you feel like money and stuff is like, ah, that's what's going to give me it in life. That's where it is. He says, you always feel like you won't have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when the time and, time and age start to show, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you, they finally bury you. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. And I wonder that last example, maybe some of you can relate to this. I've known so many students for whom being smart is super important. It's where they find a sense of value and meaning and worth. And what does this bring with it? It brings, it means when you have a test, you feel so anxious. And it means that when you don't get that, that grade that you wanted to get on the paper, you got like a lesser grade, then you feel kind of crushed. And so these emotions inside, they're like, man, I wish I didn't freak out and feel anxious when I had a test. This friend of mine, he's relaxed and it's no problem for him. Like, why, can't, why am I not free? Wallace would say, it's because you, you're living for something. And what you're living for is going to have this enormous impact upon what's going on inside in these dynamics of internal freedom. And Keller puts it this way. He says, whatever is the object of your meaning and satisfaction ultimately controls you. So you are never your own master. You're never actually free in the contemporary definition. Something else is always mastering you. So we like to say, I can do whatever I want as long as no one else is hurt. And what Wallace and Keller are saying is, that's not real. Inside, you're compelled to do and to feel certain kinds of ways because you're, you're living for something and you're not free in that kind of a sense. So the key, key question, the interesting question for us is, what is going to be our master? What are you going to live for? Wallace says, you can't help it. You're gonna live for something. What is it gonna be? And what that thing is, is gonna have this really important impact upon what's going on inside and whether you feel free or whether you don't. I wanna give us an opportunity here just to think for a moment. I want to explain something here because Wallace would say it's really, really useful for us to, to understand what that thing is that we're living for. And I want to give you a couple of questions to help you think about that in your own case. It's a little bit hard if you just, if I just ask you, what are you living for? You might say, I don't know. I think many of us would say, I'm not living for anything. <laughs> this is how we feel about our lives, I think. But there are some things that can help us to see maybe what's going on. So here's a question. I want you to think about when you have been really anxious or when you have been really angry in the past few months. Okay, so when are some times like that? In, in which circumstances do you feel these ways? What does that tell you about what you look to for meaning and satisfaction? And the reason why this question is helpful is because you get really, really anxious when the thing that you're living for is threatened. 
Again, think about the grade on the test. If your sense of worth comes from performing well academically, then academic situations like that fill you with anxiety. On the other hand, anger comes also when the thing that you are living for is threatened or maybe when the thing that you're living for is taken away. So when have you gotten furiously angry? Sometimes, for example, we get really, really angry when someone, um, when someone attacks the thing in us that we think is really the important thing. So stick with the same example. So suppose someone else, you hear someone else say about you, well, she's not really that smart. She's not really that good of a student. And that's the thing that's the, of value for you. You're gonna get so angry at that comment. Whereas if the student had just said to you, she's not very good at ice skating, you know, you might think, yeah, who cares? I'm not very good at ice skating, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter to you, but you get angry when someone messes with the thing that matters to you. So that's the first question. The second is, what do you think about Wallace's claim that everyone worships? If I ask your friends, what do they think? What do you think they would say you worship? So I literally want to take maybe three minutes. We're not going to take a long time, but just to begin to think about this. So I'm going to pause and right where you are, I'm going to let you ponder these questions for a couple of minutes and see if you can get some insight into Wallace's point about your own life. What are you living for? While we're waiting for some reflection, maybe we can take a look at the discussion. It's very busy right now in the comments section. And I'm truly wondering, I mean, I'm very excited about all of the comments. It's, it meant that you guys um, care about the topic, but I wonder if you can also follow John's presentation along because there's just so much happening in the comments section. Um, so there's one question that caught my eye. So maybe John, you can answer it right now and then we can continue. Okay. Um, the question goes like this. Wouldn't you say artistic expression also has its limitation? What kind of art we create can be harmful to others and therefore can be limited by laws, for instance, laws of hate speech? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. I think I would agree with what the, the person who's writing that would say. Um, artistic, what art has an impact on other people. Art has a, in, sometimes art has an enormous impact on other people and on cultures. So yes, oftentimes governments regulate that in certain kinds of ways. Um, the, the student who wrote that gives one example. They might say something counts as hate speech and we say you, you, can't, you can't write that. Other times governments will regulate stuff that seems, um, or use different terms for this, ob obscene, like somehow it's presenting something that is degrading and people shouldn't be seeing these kinds of things. So yeah, I think um, this is another area where this is an interesting question to, to think about because we think of art as being a place where we should be free to express whatever. But um, again, maybe in real life, it doesn't, it's not so easy that way. Thank you. So I see lots of comments about being anxious about school and yeah. um, piano performances. And then some people say that they don't, they don't care at all. So it really yeah. um, depends on the person. Great. So yeah, maybe I should make a last couple of comments and then we can look at a, a couple of other questions. And I, I would encourage you to kind of take this question home because I realize we, this maybe isn't the best setting for you to spend some time carefully reflecting upon it. But um, Wallace's thought, Keller's thought, I would agree with this. Is it, you, we don't, none of us escapes this. So there is something in your life that you look to for a sense of meaning. And it's kind of useful to understand what that is and what that then means for us. I wanna li leave us with a couple of questions here that, um, that Keller suggests. You know, um, LCC is a, is a Christian university you probably already know that. And what does that mean? You might wonder, well, it doesn't mean that you have to be a Christian to go to LCC. It doesn't mean that you have to accept Christian views when you're in the classroom um, or anything like that. But it does mean that you have an opportunity while you're at LCC to hear a Christian perspective on some of these kinds of topics of life, some of these important topics. And I wanted to just share a little bit of my own perspective about this particular, about this particular topic. Because we... Oftentimes when people think about religion, 
I've heard this oftentimes with students, they think, man, the thing I don't like about that, the thing I don't like about God, um, in fact, I've had students say this very thing, the thing I don't like about the idea of God is I don't like this idea of not being free, that somehow God's going to tell me what to do and God's going to mess in my life and kind of interfere with the, my, the, the things I want to do or something like that. And I think what Wallace says here gives us a really interesting angle on this question, because I might say back to a student like that, well, if Wallace is right, then you're not free anyway. So this idea that, well, if I stay away from God, then I kind of get to be my own master. Wallace is saying that's an illusion. No one is their own master. You've got to serve somebody. So the only interesting question is what? And it's so interesting question to think about this is, you know, as a, as a Christian, I would say I, I serve Jesus. That's my, that's my master. So interesting question is to say, okay, how does that compare? How does that work? How does that feel compared to other things you might serve? Is that easier? Is that, uh, or is that harder than say serving my intellect and orienting my life around being a smart person, which by the way, I used to do when I was younger. So I, we could talk about that. Is that easier or harder than serving money and orienting my life around having to earn and having to, is that easier or harder than serving the opinions of others and having to live so that I appear a certain way in the, in the eyes of other people or around me. So Keller asked this question, which, which master that you're gonna serve is going to affirm and cherish and empower and honor you? And which ones are going to exploit and abuse you? What kinds of masters are easy to serve and what kinds of ones are hard to, hard to serve? And it's worth seeing that, you know, when people think about the constraints that come with being related to God. And I would say, yes, there are constraints. Um, and I would say with Wallace, there are always constraints. So that's not anything unique to that domain. But the question again would be like, what kinds of constraints give life and what kinds of constraints don't? One of the constraints of following Jesus, he says, you've got to forgive people. So when people have wronged you, you have to forgive that and you have to be willing to let that go. That's really, really, really hard. And I think there are a lot of people, I've known a lot of people would say, well, you don't know what this person said. I, I cannot forgive that. I must not forgive that. I shouldn't forgive that. And we'll say things like this. But if you know anything at all about psychology, you know that unforgiveness is so bad for us. So unforgiveness, um, it can actually cause physical problems. It can give you stomach issues, digestive issues, um, can ruin your health. And forgiveness is incredibly free uh, and liberating thing. So there's a constraint here, yes. But the question is, is that a life-giving constraint or is that a life-stealing constraint? And it's the same kind of question. You, I would encourage you to ask yourselves about what you're living for. So if you are living for the opinions of other people, there's a constraint with that, isn't that? You're not able to say what you think. You have to say what you think other people want to hear. Is that a life-giving constraint or is that a life-stealing constraint? So to summarize, if I could try and sum up briefly in here, freedom, important. We all want it. We all value it. Political freedom is awesome, and I'm glad that we have it. We have this understanding often where we say freedom means I get to do whatever I want as long as no one else is hurt. And I've tried to give some reasons to show that in the real world, freedom doesn't quite work that way. There are other values that come in that complicate that picture that picture quite a bit. And I've also tried to suggest that there's this whole other domain of freedom that we don't usually think about, what we could call internal freedom. Freedom from anxiety, freedom from fear, freedom from um, the, the thought that I have to please other people. That, that's a really important domain. In fact, I would argue our quality of life has a lot more to do with our internal freedom than with our external and political kind of freedom. And so the question there that I want to leave you with is, leave you with is, do you have that kind of a freedom? And it to reflect upon Wallace's question, Keller's question, like, what are you living for? And how is that working for you? And if it's not working real well, then maybe it's, it's time to consider living for something different. Okay, I'm going to stop the share there. And I'm going to go back then to, to the main screen here. And Lydia, um, I'll let you you say if we have some other questions that you think would be worthwhile coming to. Yeah, well, um, 
Thank you so much, Don, for the lecture. Um, I enjoyed it and I'm sure that our participants enjoyed it as well. The discussion has been crazy. I mean, in a good way, there has been so many uh, fruitful and helpful and thought provoking comments. Honestly, but it was very uh, difficult for me to follow. So I'm sure that this discussion is going to then continue in our online uh, discussion board, uh, but I was able to jot down some questions that I thought were interesting. Um, so I'm going to read them to you uh, and then uh, maybe you can respond. Okay. Um, so the first question that I have here is how would the world look like if everyone were granted freedom? That's pretty interesting. Well, I guess what I would want to ask in return was, what do you mean by freedom in that sense? So if everyone were granted political freedom, um, uh, maybe in the sense that mill means that, so, okay, you're free to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm other people. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting. It would look different than our own world, for sure. And we see that when you look around the world, some countries there is more freedom, some countries there is less freedom. But um, in all countries that I'm aware of, there is much less freedom than what Mill is advocating here. Uh, so, and again, the reason for that is that we make trade-offs uh, about uh, freedom against other kinds of things that we also think are important. But I definitely would say I'm a big fan of political freedoms. I mean, it's I think it's great that we have freedom, for example, to, to gather like we are doing here and to talk about ideas, because that's not something actually you can do in all places. So uh, freedom's a good thing in a political sense. Yeah, and definitions are very important, and I think um, it was very helpful to look at the different ones um, today and try to decide which ones um, you agree with. Um, there's one more question um, that I'm going to read, and then I'm going to maybe paraphrase a little bit. Um, okay. So the question is, do you think persuading yourself not to worry about your future is bad? So I think that was in relation to... Um, internal freedom right and um trying yeah. to um have control over yourself or have uh, or deciding what you choose to worship so to speak yeah okay i like that question um i guess i want to say two things i want to say that worry is never good so i don't think worry ever helps at all i mean actually jesus put this really well he says who by worrying can add a single hair to your head um or add a day to your life or anything like, so worry never actually helps anything at all. If, and I think the challenge for us is that, I'm not sure that we often can talk ourselves out of worrying. So worry comes from, it's grounded in what we believe. So if I believe that that test I'm taking tomorrow is determinate, determining my worth, I am going to worry about it. And there's not anything I can do about that. I can tell myself, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, not gonna work. I think the key to changing our worry is changing our beliefs. And so if I can come, if I come to believe something differently about that and think, you know, it's just a test and it's not that it's unimportant, but I still have worth as a human being, even if I do terribly on the test, then I'm going to feel really, really differently about the test. So our worries are grounded in what we believe is true about ourself and, and, uh, yeah, those are complicated matters. And usually things we don't change like in a day, but we can start to start to think about whether we might change those kinds of beliefs. Yeah, that kind of reflection is, uh, is very important, especially these days when we are, you know, with ourselves so much more and we actually have time to pause and reflect. Um, so there's lots of questions. And like I said, we probably won't have time to answer all of them. So let's continue the discussion in the online discussion board and I'll um, share information on how to join in um, a minute or so but uh, let's take two more questions so the first question okay. uh, is for you John very uh, personal one but maybe you yes. can give it a go so I wonder what do you personally think freedom is and um, do you think you have it ah this is so good um, so I guess I would say that all of both of these kinds of freedom and ex external political freedom is, is real. And that's part of what freedom is or one understanding of what freedom is. And then this internal sense that I was talking about is also what freedom is. So I think both of those things are freedom. 
and uh, and they're both important. And I guess if I could speak to both of them, I feel like, yeah, living in Lithuania, I have a lot of external freedom. So it's a you know a very free country in that way. So I guess I have the political freedom. Internal freedom is something I feel like I want to say one has in a matter of degree. So I guess I could say this: I I feel fairly free. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that there are things still inside in my life where I'm not there entirely. I still have emotional reactions that I don't want to have. I still can feel ways about people that I don't want to, to want, want to feel. But absolutely, my experience over the last years has been one of growing in that sense of freedom. So there's a lot inside that I don't wrestle with that maybe I used to. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing. And there's one more question that's not directly related to the topic, but I think it's um, important um, for us to answer. And I think you are the right person to answer that question. So it is, uh, can LCC be for people who do not believe in God or are not sure of his existence? Yeah, good. So I teach a class at LCC on, on worldviews. Uh, maybe this is a familiar term or not about like, um, our big picture, what we think about the world and things like religion and faith and morals and all that stuff. And I often ask my students where they're coming from. And the thing that I found is pretty consistent is my students are in thirds. So I have kind of a third of my students that say, yeah, I would, I'm a religious believer of some kind. About a third of my students who say, uh, I kind of think that maybe there's a God and, you know, maybe I'd call myself Catholic. You know, a lot of people in Lithuania call themselves Catholic. Um, because they grew up that way. And then about a third of students would say, I'm, there is no God, I'm an atheist, or I'm a, a complete skeptic or something like that. So lots and lots of students like that. And uh, they've really liked the class and it's been really good. And it's been really good to have them in there. So one of the things that I think is, is nice about LCC and that is rich is that you get to hear from and interact with students who are coming from all kinds of different places. You know, I have Muslims in my classroom as well, who are, you know, from Syria and atheist student from Estonia. And it's like two different worlds entirely. And uh, those make for really, really good discussions. So I'd say absolutely. Yes, is the answer. And um, that's it, I guess, on um, our part for today. Um, John, thank you so, so much for sharing, for Welcome. finding the time. Um, it was a pleasure to, to learn from you and to read all of those comments. Um, Truly an amazing experience and I hope we'll continue in such a way and learn um, together.